Good morning. Nice to be here with all of you. Thanks again to the VW Stiftung and to all the work that has been done before this symposium. Thanks to the mayor. Um, Martin did an overall view about what he said is necessary to have a mix of research through design, by design, and for design. And he showed some examples. So I dive in more closely what is the approach of the Studio Urbane Landschaften. Following the question, what does a researching de designing process need? Need to be successful, of course. Starting out, I have two quotes. The pathways leading to the creation of new knowledge are manifold and never straightforward. That's from Helga Novotny and a poem from Bertolt Brecht, which I only know in German. Gehe ich zeitig in die Lehre, komme ich aus der Lehre voll. Wenn ich mit dem Nichts verkehre, weiß ich wieder, was ich soll. So the story about diving in the emptiness and coming out and knowing what to do. And these two quotes are very important for me. They guide me and they will be in the background of my speech. So following the question, uh, what do we need? I start out, I put this in five or six uh, chapters and I, you don't have to read them all now, I come to them. I start out with basic orientations because what researching designing needs in my opinion are basic, op basic orientations. And those orientations, the first one is to really doing landscape, and you already mentioned, mentioned that, doing it and involved directly with everyday life and with sociality. And this almost follows what I quote from Schneidewind. But I think at first it's more important uh, to use more ethic moral goals and I found this quote from Schweitzer living in the midst of lives wanting to live and I think that sounds like some goal of the Anthropocene because it already pronounces how much we are in charge about balancing life chances and the next one ankle tau click fit for our grandchildren sounds nicer than sustainability of course very much pictorial so I use that and for me, it's important that this, this always contains the uh, transformational part of uh, researching and designing. So we need that. What do we need more? The second thing is that we, of course, need a contemporary, what I call a contemporary notion of our field of work. I always use these sketches I do while I'm thinking. So. Maybe you can read them, maybe not. Mm, I think this Raumgeschehen is a very good term for that. In German, Raum means as well space as site as place. So it covers the whole thing of Raum. And then Geschehen is an old fashioned nice word which covers all these complicated, multidimensional, topological, dynamic, performative, situative, ongoing, and all we have this necessary but complicated definitions of what we are dealing with. So I think Raumgeschehen puts that in a nice, easy frame. And Geschehen has no hierarchy. It's more coexistent, it's mixed, it's narrative, so it fits very well. But what is good about this, as soon as we look at what we work at as Geschehen, we have the freedom of really finding questions and things that are really of interest. So we can start out to do research. And then if we put on our glasses to look at Raum, at space, we have lost the, boundary, the boundaries of our discipline. We can look anew and start researching and discern from a spatial view relevant and interesting questions. When we do that as a studio Urbane Landschaften, we usually 
we usually look at the first design step at the Raumgeschehen as a specific urban landscape, as Martin showed us. And we do that uh, because this contains the notion of the human, influence, human urban lifestyle influence on all regions we have, not only the uh, covering of urbanization, but the influence we have on all regions. And this uh, urban landscapes tell something about that there are no, no oppositions anymore between men and nature or cities and countryside. And last not least, in this term of landscape in our discipline, there is always this beauty in it. It's a, it's a nice term of telling something relational and at the same time talking about the beauty it has. So by now, I think we all are able to have, to look at urban landscape with some affections. Martin showed us. I show you only two more pictures of urban landscape and what they look like. We are used to look at things like this at parts of the landscape, or we know that landscapes look like, like this. Does the moon show? No, the moon is lost. Hmm, sorry. <laughs> is there? Okay, I can see it there. But how we now dis but how do we perceive these different Raumgeschehen? How how do we witness them? How do we express them? How do we find questions, solutions from a more systematic way? So the next thing researching, designing needs is what I call a double process of intuition and rationality to do this researching, designing work. And I explain this shortly. The process usually, do I have a? The process usually starts with an impulse and the process moves, somewhat simplified here, switching back and forth and through three main scale sections. The whole of an area or a Raumgeschehen, and then a whole dimension or a layer or a theme in the middle, and then to a situation or part or one thing, or the other way around. The process is an iterative one. It moves onwards, trying to be more precise and pre precise, going back to experimental interventions, but going onwards like an in this iterative way. And on this way, it always needs these, uh, these little points you see where the intuitive and the rational pathway meet. These little points are the interfaces between the intuitive part, path and and the rational path, and these are very important. I come to that later. So to do, in order to do this kind of design process, of researching designing process, it's clear that you need two faculties, two kinds of skills. You need the rational technical, of course, and the qualitative and often intuitive ones, and the interplay. And as we already heard, the technical part uh, is often very much, or is very much worked on doing research on and so on, whereas the intuitive part is always somewhat foggy. Or you could even say, as uh, grain vapor and ray textures put it very drastically, with the knowledge of the natural sciences and the human humanities, humankind has reached a limit. But the neglect, neglected part of intuition and qualitative is getting more and more accepted and discussed. We already heard that. I just show you one example where you can see how it gets under discussion. This is a huge European research uh, project which tries with computers to construct our brains and they tried to get rid of the qualitative working cognition neurosirens, but they didn't succeed because they became under 
discussion. So this is just an example of showing that it reaches, this discussion reaches all kinds of research. But what, why do we, so I shall concentrate on the intuitive side and we do on this conference as you have heard, but why? And I would like to say two reasons. First, with this intuitive uh, creative ability, it is possible to grasp a whole complex Raumgeschehen as one, as a whole, so that's the first thing, and not only to grasp it, but be inventive about it. This inventive invention is part of this intuitive looking at the Raumgeschehen. Therefore, I shall focus on that more than on the other side. But what is this intuition, this creativity, and how can we work with it? We already heard some about it, but what I would like, like to suggest is to call this creativity understanding, looking understanding as creativity. And the background is that creativity is still looked at as belonging to a mysterious or genius or star sphere. It's even erotic, it's connected with love, it's forbidden kind of. And on the other side, uh, creativity has become a widespread social must. You have to be creative. Or as Andreas Reckwitz, it puts the creative dispositive stimulating the new as an aesthetic event is, has become a social must. So one could say that creativity is worshipped at the one side, but still banalized or mystificated, or whatever the English word is, at the same time. And thus, it becomes detracted from working with it in specific Knowledge, knowledge fields, or to follow basic orientations, like I said in the beginning. So my answer for this dilemma is understanding is creativity. I shall tell that, tell something to, for that, to that in three parts. The first part is linking uh, creativity with hermeneutics. The second is using the big body of knowledge we have about creativity, and the third is connecting creativity uh, with transformation. For the first, so this is Andreas Reckwitz, I mentioned, a very important book in my opinion. So I'm starting out with linking hermeneutics with creativity following mainly Gadama, and as wonderfully described by Grandin, and I must read that to you, his understanding of understanding as a process, because it's nice but too complicated. He says, Grandin, understanding is an intellectual grasping, getting it or not. One must penetrate it, read it, ruminate it. Understanding means being able, the capability of being good at something understanding something about something. Understanding happens, it occurs. It contains always the inability to explain. It's illumination, it's sharing something that appeals to us and demands answers. It needs participation, becoming part of something. Knowledge creation is only in the present, in the current event of understanding. Understanding thus is productive. It includes always the past and the present. Understanding is a dialogue, finding a new language. Of course, there are always preconditions, prejustices, which cannot be ignored, instead should be understood. They belong to understanding. Finally, understanding contains the fusion of horizons. So I would say that's a concentrated process of creative moments, of having creative moments in the hermeneutics. The second point is taking the body of knowledge about creative processes. We 
know a lot since a long time from fine arts, from literature, from phil philosophy, psychology, and everyday life. But now we have more proofs and more specific knowledge from neuroscience, for science, for example, or from creators, uh, creativity science, dream science. So we have more knowledge, much more knowledge. And for me, it was very nice to find an early book, this early book from Jacques Adama, which is from 1945. And it's interesting because, because it comes from the field of mathematics, and he looks very precisely at interventions and the creative process to do interventions. So there is a lot of knowledge. This is just an example. So we have, when we take the process of understanding following hermeneutics, we have to add that there has to be engagement. The, the con unconsciousness has to be engaged more precisely. There has to be curiosity, courage, love, empathy, passion, intensity, engagement, perseverance. And especially you have to involve the body and the body in motion, as we know. And the process, the creative process, contains an almost losing oneself, going through emptiness again and again, step into unconsciousness, carried away in a situation, go to a flow phase, not be separated. And after this process, there is this moment of kairos, now I know, this is it, the sudden moment of kairos. And this is, as we all know this, we all know this moment of insights. We all know how it is. It feels with a lot of joy, and it even feels as if there is a truth in it. But be careful with truth, of course. Then, as Helga Novotny says so nicely, it's right, but it might be different, too. So the third part of this process of creativity is that it, it is needed to link creativity with transformation. What do I mean with that? I go further than I said before in saying that understanding is a trans transformational moment. The past, the present, and the future are there at the same time. This fits to many of the descriptions we find, for example, by Hadama, and it happens only in the present and is connected in the present. Or if you look at it etymologically, understanding means at the same time standing before something and going across, as Tule Fumo worked on so very nicely. So, summarizing, if we take this serious, what I talked about, understanding is creativity, it qualifies creativity. But then, how do we translate this in our field? What do we do in our field? And I think, how can we trigger understanding? Because, as you can clearly see in this, what I told you, it's not possible to put this in methods all together that would kill it. But you can trigger it. And how do we do that? How can we do that in our field? The first thing is who? the first thing is called practicing to feed our minds, hearts, and hands all the time. And you see there are lots of things we have to do, we can do, we might do that means practicing. Of course, what is practicing? We know that skills and have a goal and practice, practice, but beyond that, uh, there's a re reinvention necessary for practicing as a means of joy and as part of science, as Sloterdijk told us. So that's why we as a studio established a culture of practicing. And as many parts of this practicing are very personal and emotional, you have to practice things like curiosity, regardfulness, being curios curious all the time, regardful, being able to listen, to contemplate, even send the time, as Han says, 
or following Moshe Feldenkrais about awareness by moving. So there's a wide field of practicing. The second part is to trigger understanding as it's not possible to really put it in strict methods. We create frames and rules, but no recipes. And I only say a few of these frames and rules because tomorrow, as you heard, in these six workshops, you will have different modes and different, uh, different possibilities of these frames and rules. So I just say a few which, which are important for everything you might do in our uh, field to trigger understanding. The first is that you have to invite your unconscious by walking in the Raumgeschehen, walking urban landscapes, we already talked about it. But then remembering that uh, creativity and first insights almost always come pictorial or poetic, so work with pictorial or even poetical ways. And then remember that you don't have to know everything. Completeness is not necessary in order to get a whole. And remember that there are always connections between parts and the whole. So this is the second part which uh, we need to trigger understanding. And you will see tomorrow how this works uh, for you because this is a very personal thing at the same time. So you have to either just do it by chance or, focus or change those rules a little bit for yourself. Mm, I would like to say something more about this point of transferring unconscious to conscious because that's a very important and difficult part. And I show that in two principles and two examples. So these points on the, skits, on the sketch, how do we do that? Hoop, where well, gehe ich zurück? Oh ja, yeah, okay, just look at it. <laughs> Two examples. The one, the first principle is on the way. And on the way, while walking, this can be very different to do findings by chance, quick sketches, lists, films, photos, something to, uh, to journal what is going on. And I show you an example, which is the picture of an en route journal from an ongoing project which Tim Ord and I am doing, uh, Expedition in Urban landscapes and, landscapes, and this is the case en route in the region of the southern course of the river Elbe. And in this project, I walk with one boss, which is somebody who is in charge of an aspect of the region, and I assume that they are very well informed and that they are professional, curious, and react appreciative on, little, on a little adventure trip. So the frame is easy. We walk two hours and stay at the end at the restaurant Rosie's for talking for a while. I designed a route for each one and Tim cares for the exact time schedule, which is very important for this group. The rule is simple. We only talk about what is at stake in the moment. And while walking, and more or less talking, I draw quick sketches, these, in a kind of a drifting awareness, and note quickly sentences they say. So I try to catch the moments where there's a site or situation they stick to and they realize. Mm, so these sketches become the journal of this walking, showing what is perhaps unconscious and becomes conscious. The second example comes from a research project, En Route in German Educational Landscapes. And it shows a different group of uh, young kids, 14 years old, and they had to become curious in order to do a research with us on eye level. So we, we organized a student exchange. They were almost a week uh, the country kids at the city kids and the city kids for in the countryside and did films on the everyday life, everyday life without school because we wanted to know what is everyday 
surroundings like for kids when school lasts until four o'clock in the afternoon. So the uh, journal of this walking in this case is lots of material of films. The second principle is what we do after walking. You have heard about that already. Uh, we usually do something, it still is about unconscious and conscious, getting the unconscious to the conscious. So what we do is a sculpture, a dance, a poem, a picture, a performance, something we, we dare to express what we have found on our way. In the case of the Süderelbe project, this walking with the chefs, what we do is we go in this a little bit strange restaurant of Rosis, which is good to have creativity uh, go its way. And I asked them to find a new, a, a new name for the region we have just been walking through. And they find nice, nice uh, names, which could be the beginning of making visions for this regions. In the case of the, uh, the research project, um, we did Another thing, the students had very quickly in the beginning find a title for their film and we, are, we talked with them very casually and had all these spontaneous, spontaneous statements they did. But that's of course, it's not the end of the process. So then it becomes a more uh, distinct, a more interpreted a more put into the knowledge field step, which we won't do in this uh, symposium. But I show you the examples. What the Süderelbe project does is making posters and billboards and have them, 20,000 uh, billboards and posters, have them put wildly all over Hamburg to get the, uh, the project known. What we did with the students' project is de design as an interpretation of all things and thinking about it and getting it relayed and verified, a educational landscape of their surroundings where, surroundings where we show what is important of the material sites, where are densities, how big is the site they use and so on. And do this for the city and for the countryside and focus on these little situational aspects in these educational landscapes. So this of course still isn't the end of the process as I showed you in this iterative process. It's just, we are just still at the state where we use uh, pictorial expressions and we use them as a kind of uh, open adaptive systems one could say. So I show you just quickly a few uh, projects outcomes with the thesis um, that using this path the outcomes show or trigger or enhance uh, something new which is really new, which is not worldly, worldwide new, but needed, more evolutionary, and that it uh, triggers and uh, fosters changing habits and changing, uh, changing routines, for example. So we create new fields, which weren't uh, fields when we started out 25 years ago, like water connected with climate change, for example, infrastructure. It creates new hybrid forms of project, like the water atlas, which is at the same time research, research design and using uh, new kinds of scenarios. Or it creates or it attracts new kinds of clients and new interdisciplinary work, like this Lebendige Alza, where it, it's about the pathways of fish through the urban waterways and creating an underwater landscape. Or it deals with 
designing big, uh, big on a big scale, like for example this Rhin Mon Amour, which is the three country region about Basel, or on a whole region level, like this two river land. And then it creates long processes of changing. And in this process, for example, here the tidal uh, water of the Elbe and the North Sea, in the end there is a combination of, uh, of books of uh, communicating, in this case in a real little hut with an exhibition, but in itself the hut is multifunctional and it becomes a new understanding of, for example, dikes. And sorry I use all these uh, studio examples for these theses I have, but I have to have an intimate knowledge of the projects in order to do this analysis. Or this, this approach leads, leads to uh, projects like this Lima Beyond the Park, where there is almost none water and work with water nevertheless. And what belongs to the process all the time is experimenting, is going on the street, for example, his, this trying out new mobility contexts. And in this way, I think this approach really uh, fosters enthusiasm or big resistance. And it creates a wanting to know, a willingness to experiment, and a changing of perceptions, routines, and habits. For me, this is a 20-year-long process, as you might walk quickly through the Raumgeschehen coming to the Elbe. It took 20 years, so this is not an easy process, but it's fun. So. Thank you. Thank you for all the discussions I had on that with the studio members, especially on doctorate works, especially to Sabine Rabe. Thanks for discussion, discussing with me. Thanks to Jule Schulz, who always does my presentations. Thank you all for sharing my way, not straight ways to gain knowledge. And perhaps you can imagine the many times of jumping in and going through emptiness. Thank you. <laughs>